Hello everyone and good afternoon or good morning or good evening depending on where you are in the world and welcome to the final session from our spring series of the Row Motion Electric Vehicle and Battery Seminar Series. My name is Crispin McCutcheon, Business Development Manager here at Row Motion and just before I hand you over to today's session I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of Row Motion and the services which we provide. So headquartered in London, Rowmotion offers comprehensive, well-informed forecast and analysis for the energy transition. We deliver this through our multi-client subscription and focus reports, our single client consultancy and advisory, our online dedicated membership platform, our events and soon to be magazine. Our subscription and reports are delivered through our core monthly assessments, databases, quarterly outlooks, and focus reports. Our monthly assessments feature our EV battery chemistry assessment, our EV charging assessment, and our electric vehicle and battery monthly database. Our forward-looking outlooks consist of our EV and battery quarterly outlook, our global EV charging quarterly outlook, as well as our battery energy stationary storage quarterly outlook. This seminar, as well as all of our past seminars, will be published for our members on our online dedicated membership platform. Our members have access to our latest news analysis for any developments within the EV, battery, charging and infrastructure value chain. Our live EV sales numbers our videos and presentation archive, as well as access to be able to download all subscriptions, data files and reports. Now, if you'd like to find out a bit more about the data services reports that we provide, or you're interested in having a membership set up, please feel free to get in touch with me. My details are on the screen. I'm now gonna hand you over to the chair of today's session, Adam Penai. Thank you, Crispin, and welcome back to our final session today. It's uh, lovely to have with us Dr. Stephen Campbell from Nano One. He's the Chief Technical Officer there. He's going to be talking uh, about a new technology that uh, Nano One have developed. And in fact, we tried to squeeze this onto our last seminar series, but it wasn't quite public yet uh, that the <laughs> that the technology had, had been fully uh, um, um, developed. So we're delighted to have it now. It's potentially a game changer from the way that we see it uh, in the battery supply chain. It's uh, an ability to move from metals to, uh, to the cathode straight away, bypassing sulfate and other chemical stages, which is if you've been tracking this uh, market, you'll know that the potential for chemical processing uh, to be a bottleneck in the supply chain is fairly significant. So particularly for nickel as it stands. So, this is really a big moment uh, that uh, the Nano One have managed to, to, to uh, perfect this technology. And we look forward to hearing from Stephen uh, about it now. So if you could uh, come to the uh, floor, Stephen, I'll just ask you to turn your video on and your mic as well. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's morning where I am. I don't know where it is where you are, but it's definitely, it, it's only just got light here this morning. So here we go. I will, uh, Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Adam, for inviting me. I will see if I can get my presentation up and running. And whilst, whilst Stephen's doing that, I'll just mention that we this is going to be an interactive session, so please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. And uh, one other piece of housekeeping is that the video will be made available for a week um, to non-members and indefinitely to members. So with that, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. So good morning, everybody. I am, I'm Chief Technology Officer of Nano One Materials Corporation. My name is Stephen Campbell. I'm here to talk to you about how we change the, how the world makes battery materials, which is, which is our byline. And that's what we're, that's our philosophy. And basically about the battery materials and the rise of nickel and the challenges that that poses and some of the solutions that Nano One has come up with. Uh, we are a publicly traded company currently on the Toronto 
uh, venture exchange. So I have to, why is it freezing, frozen? I'm sorry, my, my, my slides are frozen. Uh, let me see if I can come out and go back in again. Just one moment, bear with me, please. There's no rush. Uh, share screen, that one, share. Now, is this going to work this time? No, it's not, it's not changing. It can't change the slides. Mm. Okay. Let me just think of my feet here. Uh, if you can send them over to me, maybe I could share them. It's mine. it's okay. it's massive because of the video. It won't. I can't really do that. Uh, let me see if I can move move it on to another slide, and maybe it'll be all right. Sure. Mm. Share screen. That one. Sure. Then if I do that, will it work? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Right. Okay. I have to. Sh <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. That techno I'm, I, technology is, is, we're all struggling with technology these days. Yeah. I have to show you the small print because we're a publicly traded company. So you've all read that and digested that. So we'll move right on. Lithium ion batteries. Um, it, why is the cathode so important in lithium ion batteries? Simply because uh, even though there's a relatively small amount in a battery, it's a matter of grams in a cell, in actual fact, it makes up more than 22% of the cost. That depends, of course, on how much nickel and cobalt you have in it. The more nickel and cobalt, the larger the share of the cost. Um, and it's quite significant. So what Nano One has pro tried to do is to focus on the, a cathode process for making the, the, uh, the cathode material. We have a process that's patented, it's proven, it's piloted, and it's partnered. We have a number of, uh, uh, of uh, partners we're working with, Pulid in China, uh, Volkswagen, Saint-Gobain in France, and a couple of undisclosed uh, people that we can't talk about, one uh, automotive OEM in the US and one Asian cathode producer uh, that we can't talk about. What we're looking about is boosting performance in terms of capacity and durability and energy density. And at the same time, by changing the process, reducing the cost primarily for reducing waste materials, lower cost raw materials, and scaling up the process. Uh, we have materials that will fit into existing batteries now and for next generation advanced batteries. And we're also working on cathode materials for the solid state. So there are three types of, of main materials in lithium ion batteries right now, and they're all fit into particular market niches. The uh, LFP, the, there's a lot of acronyms in this business, so it'll be very simple. LFP is lithium ion phosphate. It's good for low cost electric vehicles, small electric vehicles, industrial and heavy duty and energy grid storage, for example. The high nickel NMC, which stands for nickel, manganese and cobalt, is the target for long range electric vehicles. And the, the cobalt-free LNM, which is a lithium nickel manganese oxide, it has no cobalt in it. And that's been developed for a very high voltage next gen batteries and for solid state. There's a number of uh, re reports recently um, from Tesla, because everybody follows Tesla. And they said that the, uh, the next generation battery will be a single crystal NMC cathode uh, and the new advanced electrolyte because you've got to pair the two together. And they also talked about limiting the wastewater and to be able to transform the nickel into cathode much more efficiently. This is about also reducing the sulfate waste stream, which we'll get to later on. So why go to higher and higher nickel? The, the uh, NMC for long range electric vehicles is pushing to higher and higher nickel. And this, this graph here explains it quite clearly. The black flat line here is nickel manganese cobalt in equal proportion. And it's pretty flat. The capacity is low. It's about 145 or so, but it's very stable. As you increase the nickel concentration up to here, which is 85, and believe me, now they're going up to 95 uh, to, to get as high as they can, the capacity goes up higher and higher and higher. They're now aiming for about 220 milliamp hours per gram of material. But as you can see, the higher you go in capacity, the 
problem is that the durability goes down because it's 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 at a, a greater slope gets steeper and steeper and steeper so over a very short number of cycles it loses a significant amount of its capacity this is the challenge is how do you get this so that it's as flat as the 111 but you still get the higher durability so as the cobalt goes down and the nickel goes up you lose durability so one of the ways you can get around this is to add additives like dopants into the crystal, or you can add coatings based on alumina, zirconia, niobium, to improve the stability and longevity so you get the best of both worlds. You get high capacity and good durability. And this is what everybody's going for. The best way I can explain how we do that is in a video because it's much more efficient. So I'm going to start this video and uh, it's only two minutes long, but please uh, listen carefully. It explains it far better than I could. Governments, multinationals, and ESG financiers are fueling the transition to a low carbon economy. At the core of this transition are renewable energy, electric vehicles, and batteries. The push is on for extended range, faster charging, and even million mile batteries. These batteries work by shuttling lithium ions between cathode and anode materials during charge and discharge, but performance is limited by the durability of these materials. Lithium cycles in and out of the cathode through large clusters of crystals, but cathodes are prone to side reactions in the battery impacting safety, durability, and longevity. Coatings can be applied to the surface of the clustered crystals as protection against unwanted reactions, adding complexity and cost to the manufacturing process. And repeated charging damages the coating as clusters of crystals expand, contract, and break apart, leaving the nano-sized crystals within the cluster exposed to side reactions. Single crystal cathodes are less prone to cracking and can be formed with extra heating prior to coating but this adds even more cost and complexity. Nano One's innovation solves all of these problems by forming single nano-sized crystals and a coating simultaneously. It begins with Nano One's patented one-pot process, where lithium is mixed in a single reaction with coatings and other metal feedstocks to produce a composite precursor powder. When heated, it transforms into coated single nano crystals with no extra steps, no excess heat, and no added costs. Nano One's coated nanocrystal technology adds durability for long range, fast charging automotive NMC batteries, enables high voltage, ultra fast charging of cobalt free LNM solid state batteries, brings power and cost advantages for heavy duty LFP applications. With piloting, patents, and a growing list of global partners, Nano One is changing how the world makes battery materials. Isn't that amazing? I like that. I, I love the graphics. It's very difficult to explain exactly what we're talking about. So to recap, the solution is currently cathode particles are dense and polycrystalline balls, if you like, and the coating is added to the outside, like a sugar coating around the outside of the whole particle. Uh, but the thing is that as the, as it says, as the, as you cycle the battery, the cathode material expands and contracts as the lithium goes in, as you might imagine it, it expands and as you take the lithium out on charging, it contracts again. And this breathing of the pit particle fractures it and fractures the coating. So it allows the electrolyte inside the particle, which is unprotected. And so you get faster degradation and the effect, the effectiveness of the, of the coating is compromised. A solution to that that's been developed in the industry is to grow very large single crystals or quite often there's two or three in a big lump and then put the coating around the big crystals expand and contract but the particle doesn't fracture so much. But this growing these big crystals is costly. It takes a long time to grow these big crystals and it quite often is difficult to produce high quality material with these single crystals. The nano one solution takes a slightly different approach we have a one pot process that puts everything into the a reactor, including the lithium, the man nickel, manganese, cobalt, dopings, all the coating materials all go into a single reactor. They f when you fire the material, you produce 
the cathode material in which every single individual crystal, which is basically a single crystal, but the nanocrystals, uh, have, each one has a protective coating. And this means that it doesn't matter when the crystal expands and contracts because the internal surface of the particle, as you can see in the, in, the, uh, in the schematic at the bottom right here, each individual crystal has a coating on it. So it doesn't matter if it fractures. And we can do that without adding any separate coating steps. And we'll show you the process in a little while. But what I want to show you is what we can do with it. This is a, a single crystal, an 811 high nickel, nickel magnet NMC material. And the picture in the middle is, a, is an electron micrograph of the crystal, of a slice through the crystal. And the blue and yellow picture on the other side is an elemental map. We can map the elements in this. The blue is, is uh, nickel in this picture. And this is the crystal edge. And you can see the yellow is the coating material. And it's come to the surface. You can't see the scale bar on this picture, but this coating is very, very thin. It's of the order of hundreds of atoms thick on the crystal and it's on each individual crystal. The effect of this is to improve the durability of the high nickel material. Um, here we've got an example of the same material made at nano one without the coating. And then when you add the coating, you get a much greater uh, durability, less degradation. And we're taking this forward to scale up and to making full cells so we can do some real durability testing with our partners and our collaborators. The high voltage spinel, the LNMO with the cobalt free high voltage material behaves in a very similar way. This is a very nice picture of the crystals. If you blow this up or you have a very, very big screen, you can see that the surface of these crystals is a little rough. And that's because in the section through the crystal, you can see the same thing. The coating is five nanometers thick comes to the surface of the crystal from the inside out. So we're not adding the coating on the outside of the agglomerate. We're actually allowing it to come to the surface of each individual crystal. And we've been able to demonstrate that you can, uh, by using this, you can make a full cell graphite pouch cell with LNM that eliminates gases, gassing failure and eliminates contamination of the graphite. And we've run this for nearly a, th a thousand cycles. Um, this apparently couldn't, they said this couldn't be done. And a lot of our partners said it gasses like crazy, you can't do it. Well, we found that by taking our nano one coated material and matching it with uh, a commercially available electrolyte. We don't do electrolyte uh, development. So it's just a commercially available electrolyte. If you get the right one, it'll last a long time. It's, it's quite stable. And we patented this process and we're scaling this process, uh, process up too with our cathode material partners. Just to complete the set, we also make lithium ion phosphate using a similar one pot philosophy. The chemistry is slightly different because now this is a phosphate, not an oxide, but we're able to make it in the same way and produce uh, nanocrystalline uh, lithium ion phosphate crystals. Here, the coating is not the same. Here, the coating is carbon coating and it's added in the same way in the one pot process without adding any subsequent carbon coating steps. And we are in the process of scaling this up with, with Pulid our, our uh, joint, uh, joint development agreement with Pulid uh, in China. We have uh, in designs for specifications for 4,800 tons per annum uh, plant. We have tightened up our budgetary estimates, our cost estimates. We have improved economics. And this is as part of our joint development partnership with Pulid Technology. So we are using the same philosophy, the same what we call our one pot philosophy to make all the three major groups of materials. Now, the trick is, and I alluded to this earlier on, there is an awful lot of issue with people making high nickel materials, and that's because the metal feedstocks are usually sulfates. And as Elon Musk said in his battery, Tesla battery day in September, the plan is to eliminate the sulfur waste stream and, and reduce cost by simplifying the process. When he said that in September, we had already patented in May. So we were a little bit ahead of the game there. So let me explain what M to CAM means. It means going from direct to metal to cathode. And to do that, I have to start off explaining what the conventional process is. But the idea is to eliminate sulfate free sources of cathode material and use much less water in the process. So how to make the lithium the cathode material, which, is, which feeds into the cathode material. And we're trying to make it with a coated single crystal of all the nickel, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. The conventional supply chain is long and complicated. And we'll start off 
at the beginning with the miners and the nickel metal or the manganese or cobalt metal, the miners make their money digging it out of the ground and producing the metal. And then if you want to make sulfate, you have to, you have to dissolve it in sulfuric acid, make the sulfate, and you have to crystallize it to make a powder. And this uses lots of water and lots of energy. And you have a huge carbon footprint because of that. And it adds about $4,000 per ton to the cost of the nickel sulfate. And the nickel sulfate, when you ship it, is actually only 22% nickel. The rest of it is sulfur and water because it crystallizes with six molecules of water for every molecule of nickel sulfate. So there's a lot of waste. You have a, when you ship it around the world, you have a lot more greenhouse gas emissions because for every container of nickel, you have to have five containers of nickel sulfate. So the shipping costs go up and the greenhouse gases carbon footprint goes up. When it finally gets to the can producer, you add the nickel sulfate, the cobalt sulfate, the manganese sulfate together in a reactor, and you dissolve it in water. And then you precipitate out what they call a PCAM, a precursor to cathode active material uh, from here. And you then you have to dump the sulfate waste. And this is the big problem because it leaves the sulfate behind and then you have to deal with it. And there's a great deal of sulfate produced and you can't, in the old days, you could just pour it into the rivers, but nobody does that anymore. It's not allowed worldwide. It's, it's an environmental pollutant. And then you add the lithium. Now the lithium for high nickel materials has to be lithium hydroxide. So if you're making lithium carbonate in a cellar in, in Argentina, I'm sorry, you have to convert it to lithium hydroxide before you can feed it in, which also has costs and, and, and uses a lot of water. And then you grind the lithium hydroxide with the PCAM together in a mill and you feed it into the kiln and you fire it in the kiln for roughly a day and then you have to grind it up again and then and then fire it again and do this two or three times before you finally get your cathode active material and you go okay I've got my cathode active material but then you have to add the coating and when you add the coating material you then have to fire it again to finally get your coated polycrystalline cathode which as I explained earlier the coating doesn't last very long because of the expansion and contraction of the particles. So you've got this hugely long, complicated supply chain. And Nano One looked at this and said, there has to be a better way of doing it. So what we did was we can go directly from nickel. Direct, this is our M2CAM metal direct to cathode thing. It, it's much simpler. It eliminates the waste, cost, and carbon footprint because it uses less energy. Nickel metal comes from the mine. That's where the miners make their money. So it's readily available. You ship it in just nickel metal. So there's less shipping costs, less greenhouse gas emissions. You add the nickel cobalt manganese metal with all the coating and doping materials and the lithium carbonate because we don't have to convert to lithium hydroxide. We can actually use either, but we prefer carbonate because it's easier to handle. In our one pot process there, we dump the, the extra shipping costs. We have no, no water in the metal. There's no sulfate in the metal. And we, there's less to ship. This cheaper logistics, energy costs go down, CO2 goes down, premiums for the miners go up, so they're much happier about it. The one pot process is lower greenhouse gas emissions and uh, lower cost of feedstocks, way fewer steps in the process, and no waste and less, much, much less water. The kiln is a single firing. We don't have to go through this three days of firing and grinding in a matter of hours, not days, somewhere between 15 and 10 hours, I think. And then you, in one go, what comes out at the end is a cathode material that is already coated and they're single crystal coated materials, which is much more durable. So this is what we can do. We've demonstrated that our, we always said that our process was flexible because it's able to make any, any cathode material that's currently in the market. We've also demonstrated its flexibility by saying we can change the feedstocks to metal powders rather than using metal salts. So we have a fraction of the carbon footprint and the potential savings of many thousands of dollars per ton. So to summarize everything, what we've got is in the drive towards higher and higher nickel uh, content materials, there's a, there's a problem there actually, because they're, they're going closer and closer to 100%. They're up, they're up to 94, 95% nickel right now. And then everybody in the industry knows that 100% nickel doesn't work. So they're trying to see how close to the edge of the cliff they can get to get higher and higher um, energy density, but that has an impact on durability. 
and the coatings are needed for stability. And Nano One has a unique approach to make a better, more stable coating because it coats each individual nanocrystal rather than coating the outside of the agglomerate. Our process is also flexible enough to go direct to cathode act materials from metals, which can reduce its cost. It reduces um, shipping costs. It reduces waste streams and the cost associated with disposing of the waste. And the Nano One, Nano One One Pot process can be used with metal powders as well as with salts. So uh, adding it all up, the higher nickel trends require coatings. They want a coated single crystal and they want to use metal to cam. And the Nano One patented process hits all, ticks all three of these boxes. So we're really excited at the process and we're at the process of, of uh, optimizing and scaling up the metal to cam process right now. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Stephen. I'm glad the video got working, or the, the file got working, because it was um, very illuminating. Lots of questions coming in, and, and please continue to add them. I'll, I'll start, though, with a few. So um, a question that we've had from people when they knew that you were coming on is around compatibility with this process and existing cell manufacturing facilities. So can, can moving towards the cathode material from this process slot straight into the uh, cell manufacturing uh, as it stands currently yes the, the cathode material that we produce is is uh, pretty much in the way it behaves in the in the ink making and cathode cell making processes is pretty comparable so it's transparent to you the once the powder goes into the cell making process it's identical it will not be able to tell any difference okay um working through some of the questions here i mean one that came, came up you mentioned at the beginning uh, the trend towards high nickel and i think that's Notwithstanding VW's announcements uh, two weeks ago, that, that I think that is true, certainly for longer range vehicles. But for the nickel manganese, does do you have any views on when that will be commercialised and how your technology will fit into uh, fit into that, that that chemistry? The the uh, the high voltage uh, LNM material, the cobalt right, yeah. free material. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Um, it's been around as a material for a long time, but it, because of the perceived challenges uh, of electrolyte stability and gassing and uh, contamination of the graphite anode, it was always believed that it couldn't be commercialized without a lithium metal anode, which still has a lot of drive towards lithium metal anodes for that reason. Yeah. Um, it, it turns out that um, with a, a careful selection of the material, because of course our material is wonderful, and, uh, a, and a careful selection of electrolyte to pair it with, you can make it work quite happily in a, in a graphite pouch cell. So as we demonstrated uh, earlier this year, so that's really, really uh, important. There's a lot of interest, um, as you say, Volkswagen declared that they were looking at it for next generation. They're not alone, but it is a next generation thing. So it's a bit further out. How far out? Um, well, that's a crystal ball game, really. And uh, we're, looking, we're looking at commercializing it and scaling it up with our partners. Uh, for a market that will be there looking for it. And we're also, as you, as you saw, we also have an, uh, a partnership with Volkswagen. So obviously this is part of the discussion. Okay. But timing, that, that's hard to see right now. It yeah. will not be next year. I know that for certain. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, yeah, the, the sense, for, at least from my side, is that if you look at the model lineups for the next couple of years, it, it's not, well, with a few exceptions, there's it, unlikely to be on any of those. So it'll probably... More well, exactly. Time. And the, the, the difficulty, the lead time is such that if you develop a new, a new cell, a new battery, a new battery pack uh, to mm -hmm. go into a new vehicle, the lead time for that is, is at least five years, I would say, yeah. Yeah. before you see it in the marketplace. There's so much work to do before it gets there. But I'm not an automotive manufacturer, so no, I would, yeah. you'd have to go and talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Just suggest that, yeah, common sense sort of suggested that it, take, it would take a few years because there's other things to consider in terms of putting those technologies in. Okay, so there's quite a few questions here. I'll try and work through them. Um, okay, when will your direct method of producing cathodes be commercialized? It's quite, quite a nice sort of low ball. The, the, direct, the direct metal to cam? Yeah. Um, there's, there's really the only part we need to develop out of the lab to pilot scale is the reactor itself and how to make the reactor optimized for using the metal feedstocks to make. So the one pot process. The subsequent downstream processes, which is essentially drying and firing of the material, is already pretty much scaled. Yeah. We're already scaling it up to um, tens of kilograms of scale. 
Um, so this is a bolt on to catch up with it and it shouldn't take very long, no more than a year and a year, year or two perhaps. Okay. Um, and, but the point is that Nano One, uh, Nano One's business model is a, a, a licensing collaboration model, a partnership model. We do not intend at this time to become independent producers of cathode active material. Our, our objective is to partner with people, with cam producers who already have the su supply chains in place so that we'll, we, they will adopt our technology to make the next generation cam material. So yeah. it's it's so in terms of scale up, we're only going to take it so far, and then we're going to hand it off to our to our collaborators and our partners. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an important part of Nano One's business model that people need to understand is that we're not looking at enormous amounts of capex, at least from your point of view. It, well, that's exactly right. And yeah. there are lots of companies that have that have raised that kind of huge amounts of capital, and um, have, have failed to make it to full commercialization, making sales. So our model right now is to partner with people who already do that. And, and inject our technology so it's adopted by the manufacturers that already so have got, the capex invested. I've got a question here on, on, on thickness of coating. I mean, feel free not to answer this if it's going to impinge on any sort of copyright. But well, it's it, it's in the pictures you can see. Yeah. Right now, right now, our coating, uh, for each individual material, our coating has to be optimized. As far as we can tell, um, it tends to be, for conventional liquid electrolyte cells, it's about five nanometers thick. But it's uniform, and it is. Um, it even covers. If you look at the, the the in the micrographs, it actually also covers all the corners, which is very difficult to coat from the outside because it comes from the inside out. It covers all the edges and corners of the crystals as well, which is always a weak spot. You know, if you try and paint the corner of of of, of, of a box, mm -hmm. the paint will always be thinner at the edge at the corners. Well, this doesn't happen because it comes from the inside to the outside. So um, for solid state batteries, um, it's potential. We haven't optimized that. So that's, that's further out still. Yeah. And we're still working with battery producers on developing the electrolyte electrode interface. But the coating may well be thicker. There's an optimum. It occurs to me that there could be applications for silicon dominant nanodes as well, because it is, to contain some of the swelling issues, if you have the coating inherent within the particle, but maybe it's the... Anode is a whole different ball of wax, and, and we haven't spent a lot of time looking at anodes. We have actually looked at oxide anodes like LTO mm -hmm. and NTO, uh, just out of curiosity because, because they're oxide materials and that's what we make. But we haven't pursued the, the anode materials very far. Okay. Uh, this is a question that gets sort of quite above my pay grade technically, but um, is the electrode performance affected by the orientations of, of the particles from the current collector? Are there any drawbacks in terms of ionic mobility? Um, no, no. Basically, basically, the, because the way the the crystals are all very small, and the layered materials are like a sandwich, so it depends on which way around they are. The the lithium doesn't tend to go in this direction; it only goes on the into the edges. But because these crystals are so very small, and there's so many of them, they're all they're all as generally oriented. So there's always a path through. So it's not seen as being important. It is important when you go to the LNM material, which has a three dimensional path. It's not a layer structure, and the lithium can get in from all angles, which is why it's also a very high rate material. Now, in other words, you can get the lithium in, a, in and out really, really fast in these materials. So it's a fast charging benefit as well for using the, the uh, cobalt free materials. Just on, on that same point, actually, because you mentioned it's a very high voltage material. So my, you know, I've always understood that to be, have the advantage that you can fast charge. What, what are the drawbacks on the high voltage? The drawbacks to the high voltage is it's a very oxidizing I'll get technical. It's very oxidizing potential, so it tends to react with things, other things in in the in the cell. If you charge to that high level, you might find that the carbon that's also in the electrode may actually start to oxidize. You may find that the salts you're using, whether it's lithium hexafluorophosphate or something else, may start to oxidize. If there's trace water in the system, if your cell isn't particularly very dry, you'll find it'll generate a lot of oxygen and that will react with everything else well. So there's lots of these side reactions that can go on at very high potentials that make it very difficult. And this is why there's been a struggle, a belief that you, there isn't an electrolyte that will do it. Uh, but natural fact, we've found several that work quite nicely in, in the pouch cell configuration that we showed. Yeah, and those electrolytes that you found, they're not, they're not second generation, they're current generation technologies, is that right? Oh, they're, they're, they're well known. We don't do electrolyte development. We're not developing additives the way Dr. Dan is doing. So we're actually um, just buying them from companies that make electrolytes. The mm -hmm. trick is to, is to find the right ones. 
Uh, question they're commercially here. available, but they're not, they're not obscure uh, electrolytes. Okay. Uh, and then uh, someone's asking for your thoughts on solvent-free cathode assembly. Um, anything to say on that? At all? I'm sorry, could you say the question yeah. again? I'm not sure so, I understand uh, the question. Someone has asked for your thoughts on solvent-free cathode assembly. Oh, yes. Okay. It is a technology that is, is being pursued, the, the dry cathode uh, coating techniques. It's one I know that Elon Musk and Tesla are very fond of right now. Um, I don't really have a view on it because I've never tried them. Uh, in principle, they will work, although on Tesla Battery Day in last September, they also indicated that there are currently challenges to get it to scale uh, and get it to work and make an effective cathode. If you can do it, it will make life a lot easier um, for the manufacturing process because right now they use a, a solvent called NMP, which is toxic and, uh, and volatile. So you have to dry it off, catch it in, in, in overhead condensers and recycle it in the plant. So this makes uh, the capex for the coating a little bit uh, expensive. If you can do it without that, you will save process costs, but um, it's unclear yet exactly how to do it at scale. And I think that was also something that uh, Elon Musk alluded to that they are still figuring out how to do it at scale. So I looked at it and thought that's interesting, but we don't develop cathode technologies because we develop the cathode material technology yeah. Yeah. and we don't make cells. Uh, we'll be happy to work with, the, with our collaborators and our partners on developing making cells using that technique. There may well be some there's some challenges, but it's not our expertise. We are materials people, so we make the material. How you put it on the electrode is, is a different issue. Yeah, so this, but there's, uh, in theory at least, there's no uh, no additional complication from your point of view to adjust your material to. No, I don't think so. No. Uh, I have a question about LMFP uh, and, uh -huh. and how you rank that and how that stacks up in your estimation and your your process towards that. There is an interest in, in lithium iron manganese phosphate. It's a mixed iron manganese phosphate uh, because you get a higher voltage uh, plateau, uh, which is great. Uh, the reason why manganese is not used is because you need to put a carbon coating on the material to impart conductivity because the phosphates themselves are not conductive at all. Okay. But the carbon doesn't stick to the manganese phosphate. It sticks to iron beautifully it doesn't stick to manganese. So if you use just pure manganese phosphate, you can't carbon coat it. So it's a matter of how much manganese can you tolerate and still get a decent carbon coating for conductivity. And it's an optimization process. We have made LMFP in our plant just to see if we could, and we can. Have we pursued it? No, because our partners haven't asked us to. And because the issue of getting the carbon to stick and optimizing the, how much manganese can you add before it starts to become a problem, is a complicated issue. Yes, we can do it. Has anybody asked us to yet? No, our collaborators and our partners have not expressed an interest in it. Because I'm, I'm trying to really understand what problem it would solve or, or, or you know, what particular commercial advantage it would add. Uh, you get a higher voltage. The manganese has a much higher voltage than the 3.2 volts that you get from LFP. Okay, so on that, you, you can move LFP towards high, faster charging and, and that sort of thing. From, from there. Well, the thing about having a higher voltage is you get more power out at a lower current because yeah. yeah. the current is the voltage times the current so if you go to high vo high voltage the current can be smaller for the same power and that makes a big difference in 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 the power electronics and in this in the the scale and the shape of the battery pack because if it's producing less current at the same power it's actually generating less heat as well which means you don't have such have such a big uh, thermal management system and so there's a system saving if you can do that okay um question about coatings again. So does the coating influence lithium diffusion, especially in nickel rich cathodes? No, not well, it does influence it, obviously, um, because it's, it's a barrier. But the coatings that we use are actually lithium fast iron conductors. So it's like coating each crystal in its own very thin layer of solid electrolyte. Okay. So lithium moves in and out without too much problem. It's very thin, so there isn't a resistance issue. And the lithium passes through it quite nicely, because it is an electrolyte which is why it works as a barrier in solid state batteries between the cathode material and for example, something like a sulfide-based sulfide based solid electrolyte, which reacts with the cathode. So you put this protective electrolyte, which is an oxide electrolyte that protects the cathode material from reacting with the solid electrolyte, but that's next generation solid state battery stuff. Okay. But this is, why, this is why we developed the coating that we did for the LNM material. 
Uh, I think you may have answered this in your presentation, but given, you know, we, you talked quite a bit about nickel, nickel sulfate. Um, it was a question around, will your metal, I'm assuming it's for the metal to, to cathode uh, process work for manganese as well? I'm assuming the answer is yes. Oh, yes, it works very nicely. The, the nickel, it, I focused on nickel because that's the big crunch right now. Yeah. But in actual fact, it, when we say metal to cam, it's not just the nickel. It's also the nickel, manganese and cobalt. Um, we don't add lithium metal, of course, because that would go, that would explode. But we <laughs> we, add, we add lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. But the transition metals are nickel, manganese, and cobalt are all metal. Okay. Um, then okay on the durability question. Well, I, I have one for myself, which is to, to what to what extent does durability cease to be an issue? I mean, where, where do you draw the line there? Because as it stands, I mean, uh, you, you have lithium ion batteries that are exceeding the life of the vehicles that they're in. At the moment, mm -hmm. I mean, the limited sample size there, but wh where where do you feel that ceases to be an issue so much, or um, how far do you think you'll push that durability issue? Well, the durability issue is important for automotive vehicles because they design the the battery pack for end of life performance, not beginning of life performance, and so they have to assume that there's a glide path that, yeah. that nothing lasts forever, so everything degrades, but it has to degrade at a rate that means that by the time it gets to 10 years, your lifetime of the vehicle, it still drives because you do not want to have to change the battery pack halfway through the car's life. Because you, you, nobody expects to have to change the engine in their vehicle after five years. Yeah. Yeah. So the market isn't going to accept, oh, you need a new battery pack. It's only going to cost you $15,000. It's like, what? I'm not paying that. So it's it's an issue. So they have to be able to survive. And the, the, the benchmark they're using is 80% of capacity has to still be there after 10 years. And so that's the degradation rate they'll accept. But then it also depends on how many cycles exist in those 10 years. And this is where it gets really interesting because the evaluation is done in deep cycle. How many charge discharge, complete charge discharge cycles you need, you, you can get from the material. But when people actually use these vehicles, they drive to work and they plug it in. Mm -hmm. They drive it home and they plug it in. So the tendency is to keep them, you never run it flat. And this is partially, I, be I believe, partially because of range anxiety, because you always keep plug it in whenever you can, you plug it in to keep it so it's always got enough, the, what you, the energy you need. And that means that these are not being charged and discharged, full charge, full discharge in the way that they're assessed. And this is why they tend to be lasting a lot longer. And that will, as we get the data back, the automotive people will start optimizing the battery pack designs yeah. to meet the market. But it does depend upon the, the the car market that they're aiming for. If you're buying a really top end car that costs a fortune, like one one of the the, the bigger Teslas, the S or the X, or whatever it is, mm. then you expect that car to not be limited by performance in any way. Yeah. yeah. If you wanted to buy a Mercedes or you wanted to buy a Rolls Royce, it has to behave like a Rolls Royce and not be limited. If you're buying a, a little commuter car, then the, the design criteria are different. So it's, it's, all, it's all to do with the way the automotive want to brand their product, really. It's not a lot, nothing to do with the cathode material. We're so far upstream, it, we don't really have an impact. We have to design the material and they will design the battery pack to suit their markets. And it, the, the, the manufacturers have a range of markets too, from the top end Audi all the way down to, um, to the Golf. Yeah. For example, for Volkswagen and Ford and all the car companies have a range. You can buy a Lincoln or you can buy a Ford Escort. You know, it's 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 different. And it's really beyond our nano one scope to identify that. We just make the best material that we can. And by collaborating with our partners, we can optimize the material for the kind of cells that they need to make. OK, uh, I mean, uh, the other thing I was thinking was around the durability question is that when you start to go higher nickel potential, I'm assuming the potential for, or at least when you lower the cobalt, potential for durability to drop is probably higher. So this process with the, the coating that you have and the one-foot process potentially allows you to move faster in that direction to the higher nickel or? I think it, 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 it allows us, because the flexibility of the process, it allows us to move with the market trend. When we started working at NMC Materials now five years ago, we started making NMC 111, which is 30% nickel. And by the time we got it figured out, the market had already moved to higher to 50% nickel. So we could follow it. And we went to 60% nickel, we followed it. When we went to 80% nickel, we followed it. Now it's going to 92, 94 plus 
nickel and we can follow it. We're able to adapt our formulation to make the whatever product the market wants because our one part process is so flexible. But changing the composition is, 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 is uh, an optimization process. We don't have to change our process to be able to accommodate it. Um, a couple of questions on purity around the source material. So for your metal to, to cam, yeah, there's, there's been a few questions on this. Is there, particularly for nickel, is there a specification that you need the metal to come in or, or, or so forth to make that viable? Right now, the work that we have done on the metal to cam, and it's relatively early stages because we're not scaling it up yet. It's still, still on the lab scale, but we've demonstrated that we can do it and we can make material that performs at least as well as material made from salts. Um, we're, we're talking about standard class one nickel, like 99.8 purity. Okay. And all, all the metals that we're using are about the same purity. It doesn't need to be ultra, ultra high pure high purity metals. St standard class one nickel appears to be um, good enough. Um, we don't want to go into very high purity nickel because then you get it, you, you, you yeah, pick yourself probably. into a corner yeah. and the cost advantage of using the metals is lost. Yeah. So we have to use class one nickel and the equivalent class one cobalt and the equivalent manganese purities. We appear to be able to do that without any problem at all so far. Um, we have not identified any problems. I, I, this is a question I, I believe I asked earlier, but it's come up again, so I'm, I will ask it just, to, just for clarity then. So could an existing cathode manufacturing line be converted to using the nano one one foot process? And I'm assuming that question can also be applied to the metal to cam as well. The, yeah, I mean, indeed, there are the, the natural fact we use the same, we don't use any different technologies in our process and is currently already used. They, they do their precipitation in a, in a reactor and a, and a stirred tank reactor. We have a reactor too. They have a drying step. We have a drying step. It's a different drying step, but it's just drying. The firing part, which is the huge major capital expenditure of any cathode uh, plant material plant is, are the kilns. These are huge roller hearth kilns. They cost tens of millions of dollars each. And I've seen factories with 15 of these things. It's a huge capital investment. They're exactly the same. Mm. The firing process is shorter because we only go through the kiln once, but we still go through the kiln, but that means your throughput through those kilns is three times greater. So in actual fact, we can take processes out. We don't have all the grinders and classifiers. We don't have the, the, the drying processes. If you go upstream, we don't have to bother recrystallizing because it's just metal. Uh, so we actually take processes out and we don't really add any new processes in. So having said that, the general trend in, in, in big processing plants is it's never cost effective to modify a plant. You build a new one. And when the new one's running, you scrap the old one. You don't actually try and modify a plant because while you're modifying it, it's not running and it's losing money. So you keep the old one running and then you build a new one and then you swap them over when they're qualified. So generally, generally you wouldn't need to adapt an existing process plant, but in actual fact, you could if you wanted. It's just not generally done. It's actually much more efficient to build a new one next door because it takes time to qualify the new plant and when it's qualified then you can scrap the old one yeah okay so you might have that process overlapping with the uh, you the need to be overlap otherwise you lose revenue while you're in the years you're, you're building the new plant or you're modifying it I've got a few questions more geared towards some of the commercial relationships we have and again if anything gets off you, your comfort zone then just don't, don't answer it but uh, the agreements you have with Pooley, bw and the unnamed companies are these just testing the product or are they already licensing um, and then there's a compliment to your <laughs> technology as well. These, think... are, these are generally uh, joint development agreements yeah. on a path to uh, a business relationship like a joint venture or whatever, or a license deal or whatever it would be. But they're all joint development agreements that we're working. So we're working in collaboration. Um, and then finally, I think this, I mean, some, there's quite a few questions left, but to my mind, quite a few of them are going over ground that we've covered. Um, so. Last one is actually from the same uh, uh, same person. It is um, what are the commercial goals for Nano One until the year end? What, what, what do you? I'm sorry. What are your commercial goals for 2021? So, where are you hoping to be at by the end of the, the year in terms of uh, a lot of these processes and so on? 
I think that we are continuing to scale up these processes. We're continuing to develop collaborations with our partners. We have, we have uh, established partners that have been in place for a year or two already. We have uh, new partnerships all the time. We're developing new partnerships, new relationships all the time. Our plan is to develop those relationships further towards some kind of business relationship. Um, but we're also, I mean, that's, that's not my area. My area is to drive the technology forward. And we hope to, to move, to scale up our processes towards between one 10 kilograms batch scale by the end of this year. Okay, good. We'll that, that, I can, that I can talk about. The business relationship stuff, it's not, not, not my area, I'm afraid. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I think we'll take that as a closing statement. We come, we're coming up to close to an hour which to my mind has flown by and I'm sort of hanging on to try and keep up with some of the, <laughs> the technical pieces of it, but it's been fantastically interesting and we thank you very much for your input here. And also congratulations on the, on the new process because, you know, I think if, if anyone that's tracking from the upstream, looking at, you know, the raw materials piece, the cost piece and uh, the film manufacturing and so forth would know that removing the sulfate state particularly for nickel is potentially a, a, a very very big step indeed so congratulations on that and thank you very much for your time thank you adam it's great. i love to talk about what we do it's really exciting and uh, we'll see you again soon hopefully i and, hope uh, so yes thank you very much bye-bye now bye-bye